it's been quite a week we haven't really been vlogging because i had an emotional breakdown at the beginning of the week to be honest with you <laughs> what day did i even get my page back um you said it was it though. thursday you said it you're like i'm getting my page back the night i don't give a fuck the night before four days ago so when was that gabby i don't know you're looking at me you don't know i don't know when was four days ago bro okay so we got Caesar and body a birthday cake. It's peanut butter banana. My favorite. <laughs> yeah. Any words to explain how much I love Caesar? I'm outside with Caesar. Oh, okay, sweet. I'll have a technician come right out. Thank you so much. Uh, of course, of course. I look pale as fuck. Mm. I'm not gonna lie there, you do look a little pale. Yeah, so did my cellus tonight. Why do you look so pale? Because I am. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. like, I just feel like she's speaking that onto him and that's it's not It's not speaking onto it, you can, have, you can have concerns, Gabby, and speak about it. You don't need to not speak about concerns because it's speaking it into existence. Danny, but you crying, like, you already got the worst news Gabby, ever. Gabby, it doesn't matter. I would cry even if it wasn't the worst news. I cried when I dropped him off to get his nails f***ing trimmed. Like, I have emotions. I'm emotional about my dog. I can be emotional about my dog. You guys said you weren't close in high school, so what made you close after that? Bad Girls Club. Yeah, getting her ass beat on Bad Girls Club. I don't think it was the ass beating part. I think it was just the whole experience in general. Yeah, because we were, like, literally forced to be friends. <laughs> we should have been friends our whole life. Do you make more money doing videos for YouTube or for Wave? Wave. Wave. Like, <laughs> YouTube is, like, working for free, pretty much. Just for anyone uh, out there. Yeah. It is, like, Wait, depending I feel on how like much you, work you put into it. I feel like YouTube, for me, I'm just trying to please people that can't get to our wave. So it's like, I don't want to abandon them. If it has nothing to do with Bad Girls Club, no one wants to tune it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I've noticed that too. Like, it's just like, like making that switch from, like, my old content to true crime. It's just, it's, so it's called Growing Pains. Dad's calling. It's, it's because I sent him a picture of Caesar's neck. Put on speaker. Hello? Why would you send me that? <laughs> Why wouldn't I send you that, Dad? I mean, well, I mean, so well, what does that mean, Danny? I mean, that's what I'm saying. Dad, obviously I don't know. I'm, like, freaking out about it. Why are you freaking out over something that you have no control over? That's what I've been saying. What the fuck? I, I don't understand you two. Why are you saying you two? What the fuck? everyone i'm sitting in the car that isn't my car and i also have no idea how vloggers like film themselves in cars because how do they not get like the steering wheel and shit it why it looks like i'm sweating it's because i'm not my face last night was so dry like so so dry like almost looked like sandpaper so i just put about 17 pounds of moisturizer on as well as some glow serum from pixie starbucks drinks that went viral on tiktok so i'm gonna try them but i'm not gonna do what everybody else does and i'm not gonna go and get every single drink at one time i'm gonna go and get one at a time powder this is one of the viral TikTok drinks. So I got that to try a tall of this viral TikTok drink that everyone said was amazing. Was $4.35, just so anyone's wondering. And that's tall, something you'd roll up to Starbucks at noon or one o'clock in the afternoon and be like, yo, let me get the strawberry refresher with heavy cream and vanilla bean powder said no one ever except for people trying the viral TikToks, including me, lol. to another episode right episode video of true crime with me yours truly danielle victor but that's danny with two n's since my normal youtube i just think is not appropriate for true crime videos and for anyone that hasn't seen 
an old YouTube video. Um, I have this like 43 second video intro where I'm like, bitch, it's Danny with two N's. So I'm Danielle Victor. I prefer to be called Danny. A lot of people spell Danny incorrectly. It has two N's in it. And people are like, well, where did you get the second N? And I'm like, well, and when I was in kindergarten or first grade, my mom told me that I came home one day and I was just like, it's Danny with two N's, and it's just been that way ever since. Every reality show I've ever been on, they spelt it incorrectly. And I'm here to tell you to spell it incorrectly! <laughs> Anyways, we're back. Last week, I covered the Lululemon murder, so if you haven't watched that yet, please go ahead and head to my true crime playlist. Yes, there is a true crime playlist. And watch whatever video you haven't watched yet. I've definitely gotten a lot better at telling true crimes as my first couple of ones are not bad, but also not great. And I've just, you know, decided to take my time on these stories and tell them well and hopefully I don't miss any details. A lot of people have been commenting in the comments section for cases and stories they want me to cover. I do not write down suggestions from the comments section because sometimes I'll be reading comments in the car if Gabby's driving somewhere or I'll read them when I'm in the bathtub or when I'm lounging on the couch and it's hard for me to write down your suggestion and then I'll forget to go back and write down your suggestion and then your suggestion is lost in the comments section. So if you want to suggest a true crime case for me to cover, please, please, please email my email and tell me on email. DanielleVictorSubmissions at gmail.com. Send me your case and I I might cover it. No, I'm probably gonna cover it. There's just like a lot of you have been emailing and I have a whole notebook full of suggestions. So just email me and I'll put you in my notebook full of suggestions. And I'll always call out and shout out the person who suggested it. Oh, also there's people that are suggesting cases that I've already covered. Like someone just suggested that I do Chris Watts. Another person told me to do Casey Anthony. And all of those cases have already been covered. So there is a true crime playlist. Go ahead, check it out. I also have solved, unsolved, parent normal although I've never I haven't covered any paranormal cases but just in case I ever do there is a specific playlist for those and you can check it out but there are have there have been multiple people suggesting videos that I've already done I'm like damn I've already done them so check out the playlist this week the question is what happens when a horror film inspires a killer or killers well I'm about to tell you and I'm gonna tell you this case thank you to Danny Luna who emails my email Danielle Victor submissions at gmail.com and asks me to cover the Cassie Joe Stoddard case that's what I'm about to do. So fasten your seatbelts grab your throw blanket your glass of wine your rolled blunt I'm not even I don't even know if we can say that on YouTube anymore. Roll it up, pack your bowls, grab your lighters and your matches and your bottle of wine so you can refill the glass because this is about to be a long one, y'all, okay? This case is not short. So get comfortable and let's begin breaking down all the f***ed upness that is surrounded in and around the Cassie Joe Stoddard case. This case is inspired by the movie Scream. Now for anyone who's too young or has no idea what the movie Scream is, that makes me feel old because I feel like I've grown up watching every single Scream movie possible. In fact, I've seen all of the Screams multiple times and I guess they just finished filming a new one, which I'm super excited about. This murder was inspired by the movie Scream. Scream is a horror film, actually a classic horror film, at least for me, maybe my generation, that came out in 1996. And millions and millions and millions of people went to the movie theater to go see this movie Scream. I miss the movie theaters. Even, I know there's a few movie theaters that are open. Here in Methuen, there's a movie theater open and you won't catch me in there at all. It's just like the concept of going to a movie theater after a worldwide pandemic is just not the same. And now everything is just like streaming and completely different. But back in the day when there was no pandemic, movie theaters and going to see movies was where it was at. And millions of people went, they grabbed their popcorn, they grabbed their dates or their best friends and they went to go see the movie Scream. In the movie Scream, the opening first film ever in the first scene ever Casey Becker which is played by Drew Barrymore is home alone making popcorn waiting for her boyfriend to come over to keep her company because her parents are not there while she's making popcorn a mass psychopath starts toying with her and harassing her before he eventually kills her 
and begins a killing spree among Sydney and Sydney's friends. Much like the movie Scream, Cassie Jo Stoddard, she was stalked, she was harassed, and then eventually stabbed nearly 30 times by someone wearing a mask, just like the movie Scream. She was also home alone, just like the movie Scream. So you have to wonder, how does a 16-year-old girl fall victim to a copycat killer? We're about to find out. Cassie Jo Stoddard was born on December 21st, 19. 1989. She had a younger brother and an older sister, and they lived in Pocatello, Idaho. Pocatello is a very scenic place. It's good for hiking, trailing, biking, outdoor naturey stuff. Pretty much the opposite of anything that I would be doing. But if you're into that type of shit, Pocatello, Idaho is the place for you. Pocatello is a very religious area. A lot of the people in Pocatello were Mormon. I don't know much about that religion, but a lot of the people that lived in Pocatello were Mormon. It's not a very diverse area, and although people felt safe and thought that Pocatello is a good community, there's not much diversity, and it was like they were in their own bubble and I don't know about y'all but I would rather live in a city and I would prefer not to live in a bubble where everyone kind of like was in your business or thought they knew your business and judged you and thought they knew you and made stories about you I would prefer the quite the opposite of that Pocatello is an area where people seem to have set rules set beliefs and if you didn't follow the beliefs that everyone else followed you were probably considered an outcast so when you type in google what is pocatello like it literally says that the incest rates are extremely high like almost skyrocketed through the roof and for anyone that doesn't know what incest is go ahead and google it so basically there's some weird shit going on in pocatello not a place on my bucket list it's not a town i'm gonna be visiting ever in my lifetime. Completely uninterested. Not me, not going. Definitely not living there. Cassie was described as someone that came from a loving home. Although she still had her mother in her life, it was believed that she lived with her brother and her lived with the grandmother for most of their lives. I'm unsure why they live with the grandmother. I didn't find anything online of the relationship she had with her mother. I do find out while I'm doing my research that there's a few red flags in there that are at least to me indicators that they weren't as close as some mothers and daughters would be but I'll get into that later. Other than the little red flags that I noticed during my research I didn't really see any information about why her and her brother lived with the grandmother for most of the time but it said that she came from a loving home, a decent home, she was a straight-a student, she got good grades, she didn't drink, she didn't smoke, she loved animals and she eventually wanted to grow up and become a lawyer and unfortunately tragic will strike her and her family very very early on in her life and none of those dreams that she once believed that she would be living out would ever come true. In 2006 Cassie was 16 years old and she was a junior at Pocatello High School. At the time of her murder she was dating her boyfriend Matthew Beckham who was also a junior at Pocatello High School. I don't know how at 16 years old they were dating like when I was 16 obviously I had guys that I hung out with but but if I was lucky, my parents would let me have him over and we could watch a movie with the door open and all the lights on. Or vice versa, I'd go to some guy's house and his parents would make us a snack and go upstairs while we sat in the main room, living room, and cuddled up on the couch with the lights on or off. But it wasn't like we were going on dates. Like, I don't remember going on a single date when I was that young. But whatever, she was dating another 16-year-old who was also a junior in high school. Matt was friends with Brian Lee Draper. He met Brian when they were in seventh grade. And then he met Tori Adamchick through Brian a year prior to Cassie's murder. All four of them, Cassie, Brian, Matthew, and Tori, were all friends with each other prior to Cassie being murdered. Brian spent most of his childhood childhood growing up with his family in the state of Utah but at some point his family relocated and they ended up in Pocatello, Idaho. 
Very quickly and shortly after relocating to Pocatello, Brian met Tori and the two bonded almost immediately. They both had an interest in movies, especially horror films, and they had plans of recreating their own. Brian had a crush on Cassie. He liked her, he was attracted to her, but Cassie was dating his friend Matt. Nor was Cassie interested in Brian romantically. The feelings that he had for her were not shared by Cassie. I was really asking to do it. Saw that. I was like, I want to brush your hair. Hey, look, it's Cassie. Hey, look, I don't know. Hello, Cassie. <laughs> I'm getting you on tape, okay? Say hi, please. Hi. Okay, see ya. When I first met Cassie Stoddard, I think the first memory I have of her is uh, we were joking around in class, and uh, she was sm smiling, and that's uh, the, the image I have in my mind now is I you know, can't get that out of my mind. And, uh, oh, man, it's hard to talk about. I, uh, but... In the beginning, uh, she was just a nice person, and uh, she, you know, uh, sorry. I was attracted to her, and I thought um, she was a special person. But she started going out with uh, this other kid I knew in high school, and it, it kind of struck me hard, and I was like, okay, so, you know, I am a loser. Wait, have you seen Tori? He's supposed to meet me here at 7.30 and it's 8.19. He's an hour late. You don't even care, do you? <laughs> okay. Brian would later tell police that he was inspired by Eric Harris and Dylan Kybold, who were responsible for the Columbine High School shooting. He was also obsessed with the attention and fame they got after their shooting. Brian considered himself to be invisible to his classmates, and most importantly, he thought he was invisible to Cassie. He wanted attention, he wanted fame, and he wanted the spotlight. High school is a very hard time. I had no idea who I was. I had no idea where I f fit in among my peers. And I thought that I was a nobody at my high school. And I, I wanted to be known. And so I tried all these different identities and I couldn't, uh, you, know, you know, find an identity that I could um, not be pushed out of, I guess. So I got into Columbine. We saw these two kids. They were they were white and they reported to have gone off. Harris. Upwards of a dozen people were injured. They're running out of the Columbine. Over kind of created a subculture for disenfranchised, uh, you know, kids who don't fit in anywhere. I saw at the time they transcended their high school for the hour that they did what they did, they were in the spotlight. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to be in the spotlight. Tori was obsessed with the movie Scream, and he wanted to recreate one of the movie scenes in real life. Tori and Brian started recording themselves on a camera recorder about their thoughts and ideas on killing and on their first victim, who they chose to be, Cassie Jo Stoddard. I met Tori Adam Chick in sophomore year. He started talking about the movie Scream, how it'd be cool to actually do a scream type crime. And I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, have you ever, you know, thought about that? Not really. I mean, I've thought about other things like, uh, you know, Columbine. Uh, and he really wasn't into that. And I was like, well, I could either be alone or I could uh, join his plan. 
and uh, you'd be with him and, and you know, not be alone. On August 31st, Tori called his homeboy, Joe Lucero, and asked him if he could pick him up some knives at a pawn shop. Tori told Joe that he wanted to start a knife collection. Brian and Tori got in Tori's vehicle. They picked up Joe. They headed on over to the pawn shop. Brian wanted three knives. Tori wanted one. And Joe went into the pawn shop to get them. Which I feel like buying knives for a minor is also a crime. So so I'm a little confused how Joe didn't get in trouble at the end of all this, but really at the end of the day, Joe, who bought weapons for two minors, who used these weapons from the pawn shot in a murder, should also be found responsible as having a hand in the crime, don't you think? But we'll get into that in a little bit. So Joe goes to the pawn shop with these two douchebags. He grabs them some knives to start a new collection and the boys go on about their day and Joe goes about his day as well. Just like any high school student, everyone is trying to earn their own dollar for whatever it is they're saving up for, whether that be a car, a prom dress, college tuition. Everyone in high school at some point knows that they have to start working because their parents aren't going to pay for them for the rest of their lives. Cassie, just like anybody else in high school, wanted to earn some money because she wanted to buy her own car. Her aunt and uncle, Allison and Frank Contreras, had a house on Whispering Cliffs Drive that was in the northeast Benock County of Pocatello. So it's a little further away from where Cassie and the rest of her friends lived. But for extra cash, she would house sit for her aunt and uncle because they had animals and they would pay her whatever they would pay her for staying for a night or two nights or whatever when they went on vacation. On the night of September 22nd, 2006, Cassie was house sitting for her aunt and uncle and she had plans to stay there all weekend. Cassie's mother, Anna Stoddard, dropped Cassie and her boyfriend Matt at the aunt's house at around 5 p.m. Now this is where I get a little confused. There's articles that say that Matt invited Tori and Brian on his own without the permission of Cassie, but then there's other reports that say Cassie invited the boys with Matt. So I'm unsure of how the boys got invited. I don't know if Cassie and Matt told Tori and Brian, hey, you both can come through tonight, we're having a movie night, or if it was just Matt on his own inviting the boys to come to Cassie's on script. Either or, Tori and Brian received received an invitation to go to Cassie's aunt and uncle's house while she was house sitting. Tori and Brian show up to Cassie's aunt's house around 6.37 p.m. Later, after Cassie gets murdered, Brian got interviewed by police. And I'm mentioning this early and now because I find it interesting that in Matt's interview with police, Matt told him that he invited Tori to come over to the house, but he never mentioned that he invited Brian. Now, I don't know if it's one of those friends Friendships where it's if you invite Tori, it's automatically you're inviting Brian too. I don't know. But I found that interesting because Matt has been friends with Brian since seventh grade and he just met Tori. So why would he be inviting Tori before Brian unless if he invited Tori, he just automatically assumed Brian would be coming. I just found that interesting that in Matt's interview, he only mentions Tori. Tori and Brian only stayed for two hours before they told Cassie and Matt that they were gonna leave because they were bored and they wanted to go see a movie at the local movie theater. At some point, I don't know who initiated this house tour or how this house tour came to be, but at some point, Brian and Tori got a full-blown tour of Cassie's aunt and uncle's house. They were even shown the basement. Yep, that's right. Somehow, some way, and I'm not sure if Cassie was like, hey, welcome to Pocatello Cribs. This is my aunt's crib. If you head on over to the left, you will find the kitchen. If you head on upstairs, you will find the living room as well as three bedrooms. And why don't you walk down these couple of flights of stairs and you will find the basement. I get showing off a basement in a house tour if the basement is finished and super lit, like it's like got a movie set up and a really comfortable couch and that's where you want to hang out with your friends. But if a basement is unfinished, why would that ever be in a house tour and I'm unsure if the aunt and uncle had a finished or unfinished but I know at some point they got a tour of the house I also don't know if this tour of the house came from Matt it came from Cassie or it came from Cassie and Matt but at some point Brian and Tori found their way around the 
house from room to room to room to room and then also found their way to the basement. And at some point in the two hours that Brian and Tori were there before leaving to the movies, Brian made his way downstairs to the basement where he unlocked the door so that him and Tori could get back in later that night because they never went to the movies. They never planned on going to the movies. They had all of the intention of coming back to the house or coming back into the house through the basement door that Brian unlocked to kill Cassie. September 22nd, 26. We're skipping the last fourth hour. We're not even a plan right now. I'm telling Cassie's family, but she had number one. We have to stick with the plan. And she's perfect, so she's gonna die. <laughs> Oh, hell, you restrict somebody from it, they're gonna want it more. We found our victim, and sad as it may be, she's our friend. But you know what? We all have to make sacrifices. Our first victim is going to be Cassie's daughter. She's gonna be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? I, I mean, like, holy shit, dude. I'm horny just thinking about it. Hell yeah. Brian and Tori leave the house. They get in their car, and they drive down the street, and they park Tori's vehicle. Now, after they park Tori's vehicle, they change their clothes. They put on, like, some black outfits. They had masks. They had, like, a bag full of shit with them. And they headed back to Cassie's family's house. And they re-entered the home through the door that Brian had unlocked prior. I don't know if... Either of us would have done it if we were alone. We fed off each other, I guess, and it was a formula for disaster in the end, dude. The time is 9.50, September 22nd, 2006. We know there's lots of doors. There, there's lots of places to hide. I locked the back doors. That's all I locked. Now we just gotta wait. I was really the individual who snuck down the stairs and locked the basement door. And <laughs> it's that one choice where I was j j just kind of going along with it. I really didn't stop and say, why am I doing this? I just did it. And that one thing that I did, uh, you know, started this whole thing. And that's something that is hard to deal with um, because all I had to do was just not do that. And this may have never happened. Would later tell police that while him and Cassie were watching a movie, the lights in her family's home suddenly went off. Obviously, any teenager, and it doesn't even matter if you're a teenager if that happened as I'm an adult, I'm about to be 33 years old in a couple months, if that happened when I was home alone by myself, or even if I was with someone and the lights randomly went off and there wasn't like bad weather or something outside, that'll spook anybody. Doesn't matter if you're 16 years old, 25 years old, 33 years old, 52 years old, 100 years old. If the lights randomly go out for no apparent reason, anyone is going to be scared. Anyone. Anyone. So obviously, Cassie is spooked at this point, and her and Matt decide, hey, we're not gonna and leave the living room. I'm scared, you're scared, we're just gonna sit right here, we're not gonna go anywhere. So Cassie and Matt don't leave the room. In the basement, the power went out because Brian and Tori cut the power using the circuit breaker. I think they were hoping that Cassie would get up from the living room, walk down to the basement to check on the circuit breaker. After she checked on the circuit breaker, they were going to kill her, which makes me have a couple of questions. One, if in fact Cassie did, she stopped watching the movie because the power went out, she gets up from the living room, she goes goes down to the basement to check the circuit breaker. In the basement, Brian and Tori attack her and kill her. What were their plans with Matt? Were they gonna go upstairs and kill Matt too? Or what if it was the opposite way around? What if Cassie told Matt to go check the circuit breaker instead of her because she was scared? And obviously, as a woman, you're looking at the man, who's really a boy at the time, 
to protect you. So Matt goes downstairs to the basement, checks the circuit breaker. Was Matt going to get murdered before Cassie, if that's what had panned out? But then another question I had is, was the reason that Matt told Cassie that him and her should stay in the living room because they're both scared, due to the fact that Matt knew that his sketchy, weird-ass friends had plans or intentions of killing his girlfriend and wanted to avoid going down to the basement just in case he was like, hmm, maybe they're gonna kill me too. Is Matt somehow aware of his friend's plans to murder his girlfriend that evening? Does Matt know? Brian and Tori wanted to continue to scare both Matt and Cassie. So for instance, and an example is they took two ashtrays as I'm getting scared in my basement, as I'm home alone. They take two glass ashtrays, they break it on the floor of the basement stairs to make a loud shattering glass noise, which works. Cassie is officially spooked, Matt is officially spooked, their scare tactics are working. Now, Matt is quote unquote leaving soon and Cassie is scared that he's leaving. The dogs that she's babysitting are freaking out they're running back and forth growling barking and at one point matt recalls telling detectives that one of the dogs kept going up to the basement door growling at it and then running away now i don't know if you guys know this but dogs have really good intuitions if your dog don't like one of your friends probably trying to tell you something if your dog is growling at something in the dark you probably have a ghost if your dog is growling at the basement door there is probably somebody in the basement just throwing that idea out there if your dogs are telling you something you should probably listen because dogs have never lied they have no reason to people however they do so Matt calls his mother Sherry on the phone according to Matt's statement with police and investigators he tells his mom what's going on he says Cassie is really scared can I stay here for the night he said that his mom said no but I'm on my way to come get you I have a surprise for you I'm on my way to come get you if Cassie wants to stay with us for the night she can his mom who will later be interviewed, remembers hearing Cassie say, no, I have to let the animals out really early in the morning, so I'm not gonna sleep at your house tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and focus on this statement right here. Really quick, I just wanna, I just wanna like, talk about his mom, the phone call, and this fucking nonsense, nonsense that is right before us, okay? Cassie, a 16-year-old girl who's clearly scared out of her mind, says, no, I'm not gonna sleep at your house tonight because I need to wake up early to let the animals out. Wait, <laughs> wait a goddamn minute here. So you want Matt to stay with you, which I get, I would want whoever I was with to stay with me too if I was scared of shit. But you're gonna say no when his mom says you can stay with them because you gotta wake up early to let the animals out? Animals can survive a lot of things, you guys, and going out a little later than usual is one of them, okay? There was one time I was so hungover, I didn't get out of bed till 10.30. You know who didn't even piss anywhere? Caesar, because dogs can adapt to changes, like going pee later in the morning or eating breakfast a little later than usual. So if a 16-year-old girl is really, really fucking scared, guess what she's not gonna do? She's not gonna say, no, I'm not gonna stay with you guys because I have to let the dogs out early. If in fact, the mom said that you could sleep over, knows you have to let the animals out early, would have just said, I'll bring you home early then. If I was a mom and my son called me and his girlfriend was scared shitless but needs to come home early, I'm gonna say, okay, cool, we'll bring her home early. What is the issue? This statement from Matt and his mother who's clearly covering up for him for whatever reason has made up a goddamn huge lie and Matt's on period period and to make matters even more sketchy Matt picks up his phone he calls Tori and he lets Tori know that he's going home for the night he's about to leave Cassie's why do you need to call your boys to let them know that you're going home for the night if they already dipped and went to the movies without you their plans switched they went to the movies you are no longer a part of their nightly plans so why do you need to call your boy boys to let them know you're bouncing your girlfriend's crib and heading home for the night you know what that sounds like to me that sounds like a green light like hey y'all i'm leaving if you guys are gonna do whatever the fuck you're about to do like i'm leaving leave me the fuck out of it bye that's what that sounds like to me i don't know about y'all but sketchy, sketchy.
sketchy. Also, Matt's a 16 year old boy. Why would he invite his boys over to his girlfriend's family's home? And wouldn't a 16 year old boy who's growing up and experience, experiencing, you know, hormonal things, wouldn't you think that he would want to be at Cassie's family's house with just Cassie? Why invite your boys? Why invite them to her house? Why? Well, what's the reasoning behind that? You can't go one day without hanging out with them? I find that extremely unbelievable. And also, the only reason a parent says no to a sleepover, like how quickly Matt's mom was like, no, I told him Matt couldn't stay at Cassie's house, would be because a parent doesn't want their 16 year old to engage in, I don't know, like some but she said yes to her sleeping over. So even if she slept at your house, there still could be some shit going down. So the story again isn't believable. There's so many holes here, you guys. Matt is, Matt is, Matt is just not, he's on my radar of maybe there should be another arrest. Maybe this case isn't as closed as we think it's closed. I also find it really weird that Matt told Cassie when he was leaving that he would call her when he got home to check on her and there's no mention anywhere of him calling back, him checking on her that evening and had he called her that evening and she didn't answer, wouldn't that have worried him? And if he had told his mom about all the sketchy th shit that was going on in the house, then he would have told his mom, hey mom, I just called Cassie to check on her. She's not fucking answering. Wouldn't as a parent you be like, okay, get your fucking shit, get in the car, we're gonna go back to the house and we're gonna check on her? Because if I picked up my son and he told me that some sketchy shit was going down in the house with his girl and then we go back to our house and then he calls his girl and his girl's not gonna answer, I'm getting in the car, I'm bringing probably my husband because I'm gonna be scared. I'm also gonna bring my son and we're going back to the crib to make sure she's good. Or at least what we're gonna do is we're gonna call the cops, tell him about all the weird shit that was going on and tell somebody to go over and check on her but that was not done there's no mention anywhere online of Matt calling her back that evening or his mom or whatever driving back to the crib to check on her none of that none of that none of that is listed anywhere so for me Matt is looking like he had something to do with this maybe I got some trust issues maybe I don't believe anyone and I've just lost faith in all of humanity I don't know but to me Matt is looking very sketchy extremely sketchy and so is his mom lion ass bitch i know everyone's like don't talk about no mama like that but i'm sorry if you guys can't see that his mom is lying for him to protect her son you're lying to yourself she's she has totally bullshitted police and everyone else to protect her son and that's on period sorry sorry Later, Matt would tell police that when he called Tori to let him know that he was leaving Cassie's for the night, when Tori was talking back to him, he said that it sounded like Tori was whispering. And he didn't think much of it because he thought that him and Brian had gone to the movies. And obviously, if you're in a movie theater, you'd be whispering. But if you're actually in a movie theater, you probably wouldn't pick up your phone. You'd text somebody and be like, hey, I'm at the movies, right? Like, who the fuck picks up a phone in a movie? literally no one ever and if they do they walk out of the movie theater and they take it in the hallway but whatever matt told police that he thought he was whispering because he just assumed they were at the movies the real reason they were whispering is because they were hiding out in the mother basement of cassie's aunt and uncle's house waiting for matt to leave matt's mother picked up matt between 10 30 and 11 p.m brian and tori heard him leave after matt leaves cassie's house matt and brian decide to cut the power again while cassie is by herself now they're expecting cassie to get up from the living room go downstairs check on the circuit breaker and then that's when they were going to make their move but cassie said that they cut the power the power goes out again the lights go out again and cassie stays on the couch i'm gonna be honest with you i'd probably make my way to a bedroom i don't know what i would do if that shit was happening and i was that scared i would honestly probably make it make my way to a neighbor's house i would have been dipped i probably would have done that the first time the power went out and when i heard some ash chase break i probably would have found my way to a neighbor's house that's just what i would have done or i would have called the cops people call the cops 911 is there for a reason try to call your neighbors there are good people out there and there are really terrible people out there if for some reason i live next to cassie and cassie rolled up to my house knocked on my door and told me what was happening i might not let cassie into my house but i'd take my phone i'd step outside and i'd let her call 911 on my phone because again if this is like a psycho thriller somebody could open their door to a stranger the stranger looks in distress they let the stranger in to call 911 and that person ends up being a psychopath and then they should have never let that stranger in to make a phone call but i'm just saying there's people out there that 
that'll step outside, let you use their phone, help you call 911. Not everyone is a piece of shit like Brian, Tori, and Matt. But they cut the lights again, and Cassie decides that she's not going to leave the living room. And they're getting impatient. So now Brian and Tori go upstairs. But now they're going upstairs. They're dressed in all black. They have gloves on, they have masks on that are similar to the movie Scream, and they are both carrying knives. So they head upstairs. When the boys got upstairs, Brian attempted to slam a door to frighten Cassie in hopes that would get her to get up out of the living room, leave the couch, and come to where the boys were hiding, now upstairs. However, Cassie heard the door slam, and she didn't leave the couch. She did not leave the living room. Again, their attempts failed. Brian and Tori decided that they were going into the living room, and when they did so, Cassie flew up from the couch, she stared at them, asked them who they were, and told them that she would kick their asses. Good for her, because I can't even imagine what was going through her head, what she was thinking, how scared she must have been, because I get scared so easily if someone even, like, in my apartment with my two roommates right now, if I know one of them has left their bed bedroom, if they even walk down the hallway sometimes, I get so scared, I'm like, ah! Even though, like, I, I could hear that they were coming, I still, like, scream. I just get scared so easily, so I can't imagine how someone feels when they see two people wearing white masks, dressed in all black, holding knives, standing in front of them at nighttime. I just, I can't imagine. After Cassie tells them that she's going to kick their ass, both Brian and Tori take turns stabbing her 30 times. Cassie's there alone. Both have masks on. Uh, he walks up and he tells me, uh, "You do something uh, s scary, it's gonna freak her out." And I'm like, "Okay." And so I grab a door and I open it and I slam it. And uh, uh, then, then we just kind of go into the room and the crime happens. And we stab. We really don't have a lot of vi uh, vivid uh, memories of the actual incident. Uh, I have a, what they call a breathing hard and, and her eyes are open and she's looking off someplace else. And, uh, and then I, I remember uh, Tony, like, she wasn't screaming, but in my head I could hear that. And I know she she screamed before it happened to her. And, uh, uh, but in my memories I have, sh she's s s screaming. Between 9 and 12 of these stab wounds were actually fatal or had the potential to be fatal. After Brian and Tori killed Cassie, they left her house, they got into Tori's vehicle, and they put back on their cameras and recorded their reactions to killing someone for the first time. Killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a f***ing joke. I'm shaking. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, oh I just killed God. Cassie. Oh, oh, that felt like it wasn't even real. Uh, I mean, it went by so Shut fast. Shut the f up. We gotta get our act straight. Okay. At some point later in the evening, Tori and Brian headed to Black Rock Canyon where they stuck all the evidence into a bag and then set the bag on fire. And then they left Black Rock Canyon. On September 23rd, 2006, Matt Beckham, Cassie's boyfriend, spent the entire day with Tori. Tori, Matt will later tell police that he called Cassie a bunch of times on the 23rd and could not get a hold of her. I think he called her roughly about 15 times. And every time Matt tried to call her, there was no answer and there was no response. He would also tell police that he asked Tori eventually if he could bring her back to Cassie's house because he was worried about her. And Tori said no because it was a far drive and his gas tank needed to last him the entire week and he couldn't afford to go back to Cassie's aunt's house, go back to her house, and then back to where they live again. It just wasn't going to work for him financially. So let me get this straight. Matt, her boyfriend, who witnessed how scared she was, didn't call her when he got home, called her the following day, can't get an answer, asked Tori to bring him, Tori said no, and then gave up on trying to check on Cassie. Now, as far as I'm concerned, you and your mama, you and your mama, your mama, 
mama told police that you offered Cassie to spend the night, so your mom is also well aware of the shit that was going down that was scaring Cassie. So if that's the case, when Tori said, no man, I'm not gonna drive you, why didn't Matt pick up his phone, tell his mom, hey mom, I've called Cassie 550 times on the phone, she's not answering, you know what happened last night, you know how scared she was, in fact, you're the one who picked me up and offered her to sleep over, but she's not answering, can you bring me to her house so we can check on her right now? Don't you think if that was the truth and Matt and his mom aren't full of shit that Matt's mom would be like, yes, Matt, I'm coming to pick you up right now. I'm bringing you to Cassie's family's house. We're going to check on her because something isn't right because any parent who picks up another kid from a house that has some weird shit going on and you know that there's a child inside who's scared and the next day your son is telling you hey I can't get a hold of my girlfriend who when you pick me up was petrified to death can we go check on her any good parent is gonna say yeah we're gonna go check on her right now so if Matt and his mama his mama ain't lying then why the didn't Matt call his mom and ask his mom to go and pick his ass up from Tori's to go check on his girl? Because Matt is full of shit and so is his mom and Matt has something to do with this. Pay attention people! Pay the f attention! Matt is involved! How convenient that you were with Tori! How convenient you called her 15 times and she couldn't answer and Tori said no he can't drive you because he doesn't have enough gas because it's all planned out and the only reason the only reason that you have a story and your mama is backing up your stories because your mama knows you're a psychopath because a mother always knows when there's something wrong with their kid okay she knows she knows you have something to do with this but she ain't gonna lose you so she's gonna cover up for you and that's what happened with Matt and his mom I'm putting money on it the cops need to reopen this case it ain't closed they need to make one more arrest but let's continue at the same time, Cassie's mom, Anna, has been trying to call Cassie a bunch of times. Cassie's not answering. She's not answering, she's not answering, she's not answering. And despite never getting an answer from her daughter on Saturday, Cassie's mother does not get in her car and does not go to check on her daughter. Now, this is what I was saying earlier where I took some notes and I noted, I jotted down some red flags for me where I was like, I don't know their, their relationship or how their relationship worked. Now, if I'm a mom and my daughter was house-sitting and I can't get a hold of her, not a single time either on the house phone or her cell phone if she had one I'm getting in my fucking car and I'm heading to the crib my daughter is not gonna go that long she's 16 years old she's in a fucking house by herself in a neighborhood that's quiet and secluded I'm gonna call her I'm gonna call her I'm gonna call her by the third time if she don't answer she don't call me back I'm getting in my car I'm heading to where she's at I'm canceling my plans because nothing's more important than Kit. But for some reason, Cassie's mom called, 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 didn't get an answer, and she just thought, okay, well, she's with Matt, maybe she's busy, she's not gonna call me back. No, she's 16 years old, honey. I don't give a fuck if she's with her boyfriend or not. Your 16-year-old daughter needs to call you back, she needs to let you know she's good, and you should want to know that she's good. I'm sorry, a little red flag for me. I know everyone parents different, I know everybody handles things differently, but for any parent who cannot get a hold of a child who's staying in a house by themselves at 16 years old, who doesn't have a car, you should be concerned that she's not answering multiple times in a row. I'm just saying. So I noted that as a red flag. I thought it was a little weird. Not that I think her mom's a sus suspect at all. I don't. I just think parenting wise, I think there's a reason why Cassie and her younger brother stayed with the grandmother for a period of time because maybe Anna wasn't prepared to have, I don't know, but her not getting a hold of Cassie and not feeling the rush or the need to go check on her might be an example of how their relationship was. Was and why the grandmother might have been taking care of Cassie and the younger brother. I just got so scared it's a fucking cat. So I noted that as a little bit of a red flag, at least for me. On September 24th, 2006, Cassie's family headed home from Wyoming. They get home, they pull into the driveway, and Cassie's 13-year-old cousin, whose name is Kelsey, was the first to go into the house along with her uncle Frank. Frank is doing his own thing, unpacking the car, bringing some stuff in. Kelsey goes upstairs, she puts her stuff in her bedroom, she hears the TV on in the living room, and she's thinking, okay, well maybe Cassie 
Cassie is still here and maybe I get to hang out with her. So she goes into the living room and she starts screaming because she discovers her cousin's body, lifeless body and blood everywhere on the floor. So obviously her dad, Frank, Cassie's uncle is running upstairs who then calls down to Allison to call 911. Allison is Cassie's aunt and his wife. To call 911, there is someone dead on the floor. Allison calls 911 and she's starting to run up the stairs and as she goes up the stairs is on the phone She discovers her niece's lifeless body on the floor. The dispatcher on the phone is Telling her to give CPR and at this point It's very evident to Allison that CPR is not going to help her niece in any way her niece was dead Eventually Allison will tell police when they got home there was shattered glass doors off the hatches and all the doors were unlocked when they got home. Allison also told the dispatcher when she was on the phone with 911 that Cassie's pinky was nearly severed off. At this point, Allison goes outside and she's letting the entire family know that they cannot go inside to stay outside. Meanwhile, she's probably in a state of distraught, panic, shock, uh, realizing that she is an image that she'll never forget ever in her lifetime, embedded in her mind. Meanwhile, it's Sunday morning. Anna Stoddard had woken up. She made her and her husband, who was Cassie's stepfather, Victor Price, a breakfast. They ate the breakfast, and then she looked at Victor and she said, you know what, I think it's time I go check on my daughter. So her and Victor get into the car and they head over to Allison and Frank's house. Now as they're pulling into the driveway, Victor and Anna get out of their Jeep and they're standing in the driveway while the whole family is outside talking to one another. And at at some point, Frank can be heard screaming through a window, Cassie, I think Cassie is dead. So Victor runs inside before Anna and runs into the living room where he sees Cassie on the floor in a pool of blood. So he hears Anna running close behind him. So he turns around, he grabs her and he brings her outside. And she's like, let me inside as any mom would. Any mom would do that. She's freaking out. She's hysterical. She's trying to get inside, but there's no way hell Victor was gonna let Anna see her daughter like that so he keeps her outside they go back to the Jeep Anna takes Victor's cell phone and she calls Matt Cassie's boyfriend on the phone and says what the did you do to my daughter? Matt does not respond. Victor then takes the phone from Anna and he tells Matt on the phone that Cassie was dead. Again there's no response from Matt and Victor hangs up the phone. How is Matt, who was just with Cassie less than 48 hours ago, who has been with Cassie for roughly four to six months, have zero emotion whatsoever being told that Cassie's dead and then being accused of possibly being the one to do something to her? No emotion, no response, no nothing. That's not sketchy to y'all. Right. Mm-hmm. Not sketchy at all. Police and paramedics arrive at the scene. They find Cassie's body where they discover multiple lacerations and stab wounds all over Cassie's body. One of the paramedics touches Cassie's body and confirms that her body is in livid. They also confirm that Cassie is dead and has been murdered. Police quickly find out from Anna Stoddard and Allison, Cassie's aunt, that Matt Beckham was in fact Cassie's boyfriend and they were both under the impression that Matt was staying for the entire weekend. Anna Stoddard confirms with police that she dropped Cassie and Matt off at the house at 5 p.m. and around 9 p.m. she spoke to Cassie on the phone. She called her earlier than 9 p.m. She didn't answer the call. So she called again, she apologized to her mom. She said that she didn't answer the call because her phone was on silent and that everything was fine and Matt was still with her. She said that she never once mentioned other boys being there or other friends being in the house and that was at 9 p.m. And she was under the impression that everything was fine and Matt was staying not just for the night but for the entire weekend. Now Cassie's aunt, Allison, also confirmed with police that she was under the impression that Matt was also staying not just for the night but for the entire weekend. Anna also told police that she had not spoken to her daughter since that phone call at 9 p.m. She also told detectives that she was unaware that anyone else was in the house and also unsure how Matt could have gotten anywhere to and from their household because Matt did not have a vehicle. So this is what I think happened, right? I think that when Cassie's mom took her husband's phone, Victor, and called Matt and said, what the f 
did you do to my daughter? And then Victor took the phone and told Matt that Cassie was dead. I think that gave Matt enough opportunity to get his parents tell his parents what happened and come up with a cocky meanie bullshit ass story. I think that's what happened. I think Matt was either involved in the murders or knew the murders were going to happen. And to protect himself, he told his parents that he had nothing to do with it and that he needed their help in lying. But I also believe that maybe possibly it wasn't Matt's mom that picked him up from the house and maybe Tori gave him a ride home then they went back to the house and killed Cassie after. Either way, I think Matt knew, had known, and had knowledge of what happened to Cassie or what was going to happen to Cassie. And there's no way in hell that you're friends with Brian and Tori, both two kids who are obsessed with murder, horror, and idolized a, a movie like Scream or two other high school students who are responsible for a school shooting massacre and you don't know of any of their plans. If Matt was friends with these dudes, a dude like Brian who described himself as invisible to his classmates and to of Cassie, then wouldn't that kind of put Matt in the same category as these dudes? Maybe Matt related to Brian and Tori because he also had the same dark and eluded thoughts? It just doesn't add up that you're friends with someone since seventh grade and you don't know or don't have a clue about the conversations he's having with your other friends about killing your girlfriend. I'm sorry. But I think Cassie's mom calling Matt that day in the driveway gave Matt enough time to get his story together. Had she not have called him and asked what the did you do with my daughter and basically give him a heads up that you are a suspect and not only that you're the number one suspect I think maybe Matt Matt would have gotten himself into some trouble I think maybe the story would have been a little different maybe I'm looking too deep into this or maybe just maybe the cops need to relook at Matt he might have not had a knife he might have not committed the actual murder but let's not forget the conspiracy to commit murder or aiding and abetting criminal activity is also a crime i feel like matt is guilty of that at 4 20 p.m police detectives did a preliminary walkthrough of allison and frank's house which was now officially a crime scene they found three blood stains on the staircase the upstairs hallway had blood stains they found a condom in the bathroom upstairs as well as an unidentified stain in the sink. Now, I don't know what the f that means. I don't know what unidentified stain means, but clearly Matt and Cassie engaged in sexual activities, which makes me wonder when did they engage in those sexual activities if Brian and Tori got there an hour after they arrived, about an hour and a half after they arrived, stayed for two hours, and then they lost power because Brian and Tori were fucking with the lights. So when did they engage in sexual activity is a question that I have. Maybe no one else is asking that, but I find that important. Did they test the DNA on the condom? Did they make sure that it was Matt's DNA on the condom? Did they, com did they perform a rape kit on Cassie? Did Tori and or Brian commit some type of rape before they killed her? Because let's not forget, Brian had a weird obsession with Cassie. He wanted to be with her. She didn't want to be with him back. We don't know. There's a lot of questions that I have with this comment, with this evidence found. Whose DNA was on the condom? Was there any indication that the sex that Cassie had was non-consensual? Was it rape or was it consensual sex? None of that is listed and I get maybe it is listed in documentations that we're not allowed to see because they are all minors at this given time. Those are questions that I have reading those comments about the evidence found through the preliminary walkthrough. When the police finally got to the living room, they noticed that Cassie was wearing yellow pajama bottoms that were patterned with stars, moons, and suns, and she was also wearing a spaghetti strap tank top. Her right foot and her leg were entangled in a black cord that came from a Sony Play station that was plugged into the front of the television set that was in the living room. Cassie's legs were slightly apart, her arms were off to the side, and her elbows were bent, and her hands pointed upward toward her head. Her head was slightly turned to her right arm, and the pinky on her left hand was nearly severed off. There was a visible knife wound on Cassie's left leg that had a pool of blood around it. She also had a visible stab wound in the middle of her chest, as well as several other wounds on Cassie's upper body. 
There was a cordless phone laying beside Cassie's body nearly two feet away. Makes me wonder if she like reached to go try to call 911 or call someone for help at these stupid cut the power and she had no way of calling anybody. There was a single blood trail from Cassie's body to the outside entrance. This blood trail was moving away from the body and down the stairs. In the garage, police detectives discovered the breaker box was open. During Matt's interview with detectives, because he, brought, he got brought in relatively quickly because he was the last person to see Cassie alive and the number one suspect in the case. So during his interview, he tells police detectives that Cassie's mother, Anna, dropped them off at 5.30 p.m., which is a half hour different than the time that Anna Stoddard had told police she dropped them off, which was 5 p.m. It's all in the details, people. It's all in the f***ing details. Matt also told police that he planned on staying Friday night despite, besides Anna, Cassie's mother, and Allison, Cassie's aunt, being under the impression that Matt had plans on staying the entire weekend. During his interview, Matt told police that on Thursday at school, Cassie decided that they were gonna throw a party at her aunt's house, but then Brian and Tori are the only two people that showed up. This is why this is not believable. Number one, Cassie didn't drink, she didn't smoke, she didn't party. She was a straight-A student who didn't like to engage in any of those activities. She was fun, she was bubbly, people thought she was a great girl, but she was not a partier. So the last thing she's going to do, the last thing a person, a person who refuses refuses to sleep at her boyfriend's house because she doesn't want to break the rules because she can't let the animals out early enough is going to do is have a party at her aunt's house and break the rules and get in trouble when she has never gotten in trouble before. It's not realistic people it's not what happened it's not what's going down matt is covering for these two and matt is involved but let's continue with this stupid ass police investigation interview so he tells them that brian and tori are the only two people to show up in high school whether that's in movies or in real life if somebody's having a party and people know that somebody's home alone people are going to that party y'all people are showing up let's talk about you know she's all that there was a high school party there someone's parents were home the whole high school went even people that would be considered uncool let's talk about 10 things i hate about you there was a party High school party, people showed up, even people that were considered uncool. I told in my high school, if you haven't seen the story time, I invited like four or five people over from my high school and a bunch of people showed up to my high school party and it ended up being a disaster and I was grounded for like so long. But even at that, if someone's throwing a party, Brian and Tori ain't the only mother showing up it's not happening guess why Brian and Tori are the only people that showed up because Brian and Tori were the only two people invited they were invited by Matt not by Cassie is there text messages showing Cassie inviting them is there proof other than Matt telling these stupid stupid murderous psychopaths to come over on Friday night no there was no party there was no party there was no party because if there was People from that high school would have showed up and maybe just maybe if there was actually a party plans Cassie would still be alive Yes or no? I found this interesting as well. Matt told police in his interview that they put on the movie Kill Bill and then they went into the kitchen and they ate popsicles. He then explained to police that he used a knife that was in a black protective sheath and he showed Brian how to take the knife out of the sheath. And I found this to be fucking weird. Number one, why the fuck and who the opens a popsicle box with a knife it's called use your hands are you a growing young ass soon to be man or are you a punk ass little bitch who doesn't open a popsicle box with their hands and if you can't open with your hands would the next step be to use a pair of scissors who uses a knife that's in a protective sheath to open a box of popsicles it just doesn't even make sense you guys it just doesn't even make sense at all at all also why would Matt during his police interview find that detail of how he opened the popsicle box and showing Brian how to get a knife out of a protective sheath important like why would he feel the need to explain that to detectives hmm why Riddle me that, Batman. Riddle me that. So in every single article I've read about this case, every single timeline puts Tori and Brian at Cassie's family's home around 6.37. However, in Matt's police interview with detectives, he told detectives that Brian and Tori arrived at the house around 8.30, which is the time that 
they supposedly were pretending to leave. He also told police that Brian and Tori left the house around 9.30, 10 p.m., not 8.30, which is in every single documentation about this case. That's almost a two-hour time difference that Matt is on. Two hours. Also, when he's being interviewed by police, he says that Brian and Tori left around 9, 30, 10, but he never ever mentioned the movie theater. What he did mention was that he asked Tori if he could sleep at his house that night and if Tori would be down to come back and get him. Why would you, why would Matt ask Tori to sleep at his house if he told detectives 20 minutes ago in the interview that he planned on staying with Cassie that evening and Cassie's entire family is under the impression that Matt was staying the entire weekend. Why did he tell police that he asked Tori if he could sleep at Tori's house? Why did you have plans to sleep at Tori's house if you had plans to sleep at Cassie's? It don't make no sense. No, it does not. Matt then tells police that he called his mom. He asked if he could stay at Tori's house and his mom said no. She has a surprise for him and so he called Tori back. He let Tori know, hey, like, my mom's about to come get me. I can't sleep at your house tonight. It's not gonna happen. Again, this doesn't make sense to me because he was intended to stay at Cassie's all weekend. During this interview, Matt tells police that he was also scared. That's why they stayed in the living room. He also told police that he suspected himself that someone was in the house because of the dog's behavior. And then his mom during the interview confirms that she heard Cassie through the phone say no to sleeping over. The same girl that wanted to throw a raging party also said no to sleeping over when she's scared half to death in the house. Does it makes sense but any mother in this world is gonna lie to protect her son which is clearly what Matt's mother was doing but this is where I have to say something if you're a mother and you pick up your 16 year old son from a house that's pitch black no lights are on except for like maybe one or two and you know that there's a 16 year old young woman in a house that your son himself said that he was scared to be in what mother doesn't demand that that 16 year old girl come outside get in the car and we will wake up early to come get the dogs no mother or at least no good mother no good human being would allow that to happen no good human being is gonna be like okay well the house is pitch black your 16 year old girlfriend is inside let's just leave her in there no that's never happening it's like not even realistic it's just not realistic it's just not realistic it's just not realistic now during the cops search of Allison and Frank's home they did find one of the dogs locked in a room and my thought when I read this is well who put the dog in the room okay according to Tori and Brian which we'll get to later they went straight into killing they never once mentioned none of the dogs the only thing I thought of instantly even before I read Tori and Brian's statements that will come in a little bit was to me Matt at some point realized that the dogs were making it obvious that someone was in the house and so at some point Matt put one of the dogs probably one that was growling and barking and running all around into a bedroom and shut the bedroom door so that when his boys came to re-enter the house to commit a crime a heinous crime a brutal murder on his girlfriend Cassie the dog would not disturb them that's what I got when I read that evidence that piece of evidence because Matt brought up the dog and how sketchy the dog's behavior was multiple times in his interview with detectives and from what it sounded like the dog was out and about running around growling causing a scene causing causing a ruckus but when the police get to the house to do the search the dog is locked in a bedroom and he's probably locked in a bedroom because Matt put the dog in there so the dog would not disturb Tori or Brian when they came back into the house to do whatever the fuck it is they did. Matt tells police that his mom eventually picks him up around 11.30 p.m., which is later than all the other times that I read. Every other time said Matt was picked up between 10.30 and 11. Matt is saying he was picked up around 11.30 and that the surprise that his mom had for him was his dad who got out of rehab early. Okay, so let me get this straight. It wasn't just one adult. It was two adults picking up their six-year-old son from a house that's pitch black and both of the adults were like, well, it, she'll be okay she'll survive the night no parent in the history of ever would ever say that or do that unless they were 
fucking pieces of shit as well. So cops asked Matt, was Cassie alive when you left? Matt told police, yes, Cassie was alive when I left, but she was in the dark and she was alone. So Cassie was alive in the pitch dark of a big ass house by herself and your two fucking parents left that girl by herself because of what? Right, mm-hmm. Okay, makes a lot of sense, really believable. Totally believe you. Totally believe you. Mm -hmm. Makes me wonder if Matt actually was involved in the murder because later on, it'll be said that Matt's mom didn't ever see Cassie alive. That when she got to the house, she just beeped the horn. But I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But who's to say that Matt actually didn't participate in these murders or at least watched all of it go down? I'm just saying, you guys, no matter how Matt played a role, the point is we all can see that he did, right? I'm not alone in this. Matt then tells detectives that they drove back to his family's house. His father read his family a book on his experience at rehab. They then watched the movie The Rookie, and then they started the movie The Green Mile. And then Matt went to bed around 3, 3.30, but his father stayed up in the living room on the couch until the next day. So let's do this little fucking timeline according to Matt, shall we? So according to Matt, he gets picked up from Cassie's house at 11.30 p.m. by his mother Sherry and his stepdad who just got out of rehab, which was a big surprise. They leave Cassie in the house alone in the dark by herself. They drive home back to Matt's family's house. Now, I don't know the distance between Cassie's family's home and Matt's family's home, but it was said that Cassie's family's home was in a remote area further away from where the rest of them live. So let's just say it was about 20, 30 minutes. That puts Matt at his family's house by midnight. He then says when they arrive home, which is around midnight, that the whole family got read a book by his dad about his recent stay in rehab okay so just a couple of questions who's the entire family does matt have siblings are the siblings older or younger it was midnight midnight is late for a 16 year old super late wouldn't you want your kid to go to sleep get some beauty rest talk about your book about rehab in the morning what was the name of the book how long was the book how long was he reading for unsure of pretty much every answer to all those questions I just asked, I'm gonna go ahead and make up my own time and I'm gonna assume he read a book for about a half an hour. That means that it is now 12.30 in the morning when they all decided that they were gonna watch the movie The Rookie, which is a baseball movie starring the actor Dennis Quaid. The movie The Rookie is two hours and eight minutes long. So if they did everything back to back to back to back with no bathroom or snack breaks, that means The Rookie would have ended around 2 30 in the morning matt then says they started the movie the green mile which is a movie that is fucking three hours and nine minutes long and then matt says that he took his ass to sleep for around 3 3 30 so if in fact they finished watching the rookie around 2 30 in the morning he only got about a half hour into the green mile if in fact they started the green mile immediately after the rookie regardless matt said that he got home around midnight was up for about three and a half hours and in his entire interview with police detectives he never said in that time frame did he call cassie did he check on cassie like he promised cassie he would. There's zero mention of that in his police interview at all. Nothing. Nada. Nothing. Nada. Nothing. Nada. So his parents picked up Matt from a dark empty house and neither Matt nor his parents decided to pick up a phone and call Cass or to get in the car and check on her. They just said F it. She's good. She's 16. Not sketchy at all you guys. And why did he find it an important detail to tell police that his dad stayed up all night long on the couch? Why would he mention that? Is his dad up to no good? Like, why would he throw that detail in there? It made no sense to me whatsoever. I just thought it was so weird to say that because it was had nothing to do with anything. Keep in mind that during this interrogation, police are completely thrown off by Matt's demeanor. He's showing little to no emotion. He was completely unfazed when he was told that Cassie was dead. Not only dead, but brutally f***ing murdered. He had no emotion and police are just completely thrown off by his reaction that they find him so suspicious they want him to take a polygraph. So he takes a polygraph and lo and behold, Matt passes. And I don't know about y'all, but polygraphs have actually been 
ruled out in a lot of cases because they're just not reliable. For instance, Gabby took a polygraph on marriage boot camp about whether or not her baby daddy was actually the baby daddy of her child and it said that she was lying and they found deception and her baby daddy is the baby daddy of her son. Sometimes I don't think that polygraphs are correct and I also feel like you can also google or learn how to beat a polygraph test. So Matt probably knew from the minute Anna Stoddard called him that he was going to be a suspect and that gave him plenty of time to learn how to beat a polygraph test. Regardless, a polygraph test should not be enough to clear a motherfucker from a crime. It just shouldn't. It just should not be enough. But they clear Matt as a suspect because he passed his polygraph test. So at this point, Cassie's family, who has spent most of the day across the street at a neighbor's house, has now been put up at the Ameritel Hotel. I believe it was either for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, but basically they cannot move their cars out of the driveway and they cannot go back to their home because it was officially a crime scene. So they were put up into a hotel. Detective Thomas and Detective Gantz Ganks, not quite sure how to spell his name, but I'll put how you spell it below. They go to Tori's home to have an interview with Tori, and this would be the first out of two interviews they would have with Tori. Both of his parents were present during this interview. The detectives inform Tori's parents and Tori, who already knows, that Cassie Jo Stoddard was brutally murdered on Friday night. Detectives also inform Tori and Tori's parents that Brian, Tori, and and Matt, Cassie's boyfriend, were the last people to see Cassie alive. Tori's mother, Shannon, then asked detectives if Tori was a suspect. She then said, quote, He spent the weekend with us. He came home on time. He went to football games. How could he have done something like that and not have told us? He would have to be a psychopath to be capable of something like that. She also wrote a book called The Guilty Innocent where she discusses her trials and tribulations. I am going to be honest with you guys, I purchased the book off my Kindle. It was $7.99 and I'm like, Shannon bitch, I'm gonna need my $7.99 back. I got as far as I could in the book and I stopped reading. I think I got up to right before they're about to go to trial. And I hate to say this, but Shannon is one of those moms where you're like, well, I kind of get how one of her children became a psychopath. Even not knowing her and just reading this book, I wanted to punch Shannon in the face. She's like one of those overbearing moms that doesn't let their kids live unless they're living the exact life that she wants them to be living. She's like pretty much Reese Witherspoon in Little Fires Everywhere. Just put it that way. And I've never met this woman. This is just how I perceived her from reading her book. And the whole book was about me, 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 and nothing about how her son was possibly feeling or thinking or believing. It was all about her. And I think that was the point. I also think that she wanted Polly to make a quick, easy cashola after her son committed a heinous crime because they probably put so much money into his lawyers and legal fees that she was like, how can I make this money back? And then she wrote a book. And then suckers like me who are about to retell the true crime case on YouTube are like, let me just buy this stupid book and see what this lady has to say. And I got as far as I could and I'm gonna be honest with you, I couldn't finish it because she's just so frustrating and reading her words and her reactions to everything was so frustrating that I was like, ah! if I'm frustrated reading your f***ing words on a piece of paper, I can't imagine how I'd feel if you were my mom. That's how I felt when I was reading the book. So if anyone is interested in purchasing that book on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, it is very frustrating. Shannon is very frustrating and it's no shocker that her son had a few f***ing screws loose because if you just look at all the cases that I've covered on my true crime, 99.9, I would say like 95 four to 95 percent of them had mommy or daddy issues toxicity at the family home maybe shannon thought that they were living a perfect life or she wanted her kids to live a perfect life but maybe her actions and her behavior triggered him into becoming like a stone cold killer because he just was being drove insane at home like there's one scene she described in the book where brian was coming over and they were watching a scary movie in tori's bedroom and she walks into the bedroom and there's zombies on the screen and she's like i don't want this type of shit playing in my house and brian who had a stutter was like telling her that his mom doesn't want him to watch it too and blah 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 blah, blah. so then shannon 
and Tori's mom was like, I'm gonna call your mom. And then Brian was trying to make a big joke of it, was begging her not to call his mom. And then she grabbed Tori out of his bedroom, brought him into her bedroom, cornered him in her bedroom, screaming at him in his face. He wasn't saying anything. She just described Tori as looking at her with so much hatred and coldness. Her husband came flying up the stairs and was like, what is wrong with you? You need help what are you doing cornering our son in our bedroom like a lunatic about a scary movie and that's her own husband asking her what the is wrong with you um what the are you doing to our son so if that's the behavior she was exhibiting for most of Tori's life it's not a shocker to me that the kid had problems at all at all the book is very frustrating so is Shannon and she's so delusional she literally thinks her son is innocent I'm like you're so delusional I don't like you're so delusional it's like you want your son so badly to be innocent so you don't need to explain to everyone that your son is a psychotic killer because that's not the life you envisioned for yourself or your children i'm up every three weeks and we'd leave right after work on friday drive up all night come stay in the hotel we wouldn't miss a visit for anything tori's a good kid and we enjoy the visits we have a good time and Tori's the same person he was when he, before he went in. My mom still treats me like a mom, and she tells me to brush my teeth as she's leaving the visiting, and uh, tells me to go to bed early or whatever, <laughs> just the typical stuff, but I don't know. I think they're just worried about me. This is a good kid. Tori's a good kid, and Tori, Tori's just a kind, kind, kind person, and we're still a family. He's still every bit as much a part of our family as before. I remember the first article I read about my case. Jeez, I mean, they made me sound like this brutal, cold, psychopathic killer. They were talking about Brian. You, they were making you just like they Brian. Made, they made, they put us like as the same person. They lumped them not. together. I only hung out with him for six weeks before this happened. I think it's crazy how the last week of me being on the street, being free, really has affected the rest of my life. If you were to watch that video and nothing had happened. Tori told detectives that him and Brian went to Cassie's aunt's house because she was house sitting and that they were gonna have a party there. And so naturally the detectives were like, okay, well, who else was gonna go to the party? What other kids were invited? Any names? And he was like, I don't know, just some kids from school. So then naturally again, the detectives asked, well, do you know if anyone else came that night? Did anybody show up? And Tori said, nope, just me and Brian and Matt was already there when we got there. Again, like I said earlier, if there's gonna be a high school party, doesn't matter whose house it's at, people are gonna f***ing show up. But, according to Tori, in his first interview with detectives, it was just Tori, Brian, and Matt, who was already there, and Cassie. Detectives asked Tori if they searched the house, where would they find his fingerprints? And Tori was like, well, when we got there, Matt gave us a tour of the house, which answered my previous question of, did Cassie give them a tour? Did Matt give them a tour? Who gave these boys a tour of Cassie's aunt's house? Well, lo and behold, Tori told detectives that Matt gave both him and Brian a tour of the house. I found this statement to be interesting because at this point, Cassie and Matt had only been dating for four to six months and in those four to six months I'm unsure of how many times Matt had gone to Cassie's aunt and uncle's house where he felt comfortable enough to give a tour or why he felt the need to give them a tour of a house if they just plan on watching movies or eating food why would these boys need a tour of an entire house the house was pretty big and why did Matt find it necessary to give them the tour hmm I can think of one reason. One reason Matt gave them a tour was to show them around the house that they would navigate around later that evening when they came back to kill Cassie, which again points the finger at Matthew being involved. Detectives asked Tori if his fingerprints would be in the kitchen or on the knives in the kitchen. Tori explained to detectives that his fingerprints would be in the kitchen because they got hungry at some point and they ate popsicles. He then told detectives that Brian got bored and they left to go see a movie around 8:30, which contradicts Matt's interview with detectives because Matt told detectives that the boys got to Cassie's at 8:30, but Tori is telling detectives that they left the house 
at 8 30. Detectives had asked Tori if there was any issues with the lights when he and Brian were at Cassie's house. He said no and then he said if we search the basement are your fingerprints gonna be on the circuit breaker? Tori responded with what? No. Tori, Tori then told detectives that he called Matt at some point in the evening and Matt was trying to scare Cassie and he was purposely shutting the lights on and off. So detectives asked Tori okay well around what time was Matt trying to scare Cassie and he said it must have been before 11 because I had to be home by 11. Detectives then tell Tori and Tori's parents that Cassie's mother had picked Matt up around 11 p.m. that evening. Both Matt and Matthew's mother Sherry explained to police that Cassie was still alive. Matt's mother explained to detectives that she had not seen Cassie alive. In fact she pulled up into the driveway honked the horn and waited for Matt to come outside. I find this statement to be extremely interesting for a couple reasons. One, and I've said it and I'll keep saying 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 it until everybody f***ing hears me and agrees with me and gets it. No parent in the f***ing world is gonna pick up their son from a house at 11 p.m. in the dark and not be alarmed that there's a 16 year old girl inside alone in the dark by herself. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna keep saying it because it doesn't make any Sense. Number two, it's 11 p.m. at night. This is a quiet neighborhood, a secluded neighborhood. At 11 p.m., a lot of Cassie's neighbors are probably sleeping. So why would Matt's mother pull up to Cassie's aunt and uncle's house and honk the horn to let her son know that she's outside? Why wouldn't she have called the house phone or called Matt's cell phone if he had one to let him know he's outside to not wake up or potentially disturb surrounding neighbors? That doesn't sit well with me it's not adding up to me it doesn't make any sense to me there's definitely a piece of that puzzle missing again it's not unlikely that a mother would cover up for her son but it's very obvious to me that that is exactly what Matthew's mom was doing for Matt it's just so obvious to me it's clear that Matt is lying about something I'm just not sure what Matt is lying about also I find it a little contradicting that in Matthew's interview with detectives him and his mom both said that Cassie was alive when Matt left but then Matt's mom follows up the statement that Cassie was still alive with the statement that she honked the horn, didn't see Cassie, and waited for Matt to come outside. So if you didn't see Cassie and your son came out of a dark house with no lights on, how does Matt's mother know that Cassie was still alive? You didn't see her, the house was dark, and you waited for your son to come outside. So again, I don't give a about the slide detector test, Matt is lying about something and his mom is also lying to protect him. We need to focus on that. The police need to relook into Matt because it's never too late to arrest someone for conspiracy to commit first degree murder. It's never too late. Detectives asked Tori what movie theater him and Brian went to. Tori says that they went to a movie theater by the local Kmart and the movie theater I think was called Carmite, something along those lines. So one of the detectives asked Tori, okay, well, if we go to the movie theater, we get the surveillance footage, they check the footage at this movie theater, would they see him in the surveillance footage? Because Tori was being specific, we parked in the back, we parked by the dumpsters, so naturally the detectives are like, okay, well, if we check this security footage, are you in fact gonna be on this security footage parked by the dumpsters? With hesitation, Tori says yes. Detectives then asked Tori, okay, well, what movie did you see? And he said the movie Pulse. Tori also could not recall what the movie was about, who was in it, nothing. He knew no details. He just had a name of a movie he saw at the movie theater. Tori then told detectives that him and Brian left the movie theater and then went back to Tori's house for the remainder of the evening. At this point, clearly, during his first police interrogation, Tori is not maintaining composure. He's clearly uncomfortable, he's moving around in his chair, and detectives inform him that they need pictures of his hands and of his vehicle. Now his parents are freaking out because they don't know what the fuck is going on. They just are like, why do you need pictures of his hands? Why do you need pictures of his vehicle? They don't believe that his son is involved. They can't believe that his son is involved. Yet here are detectives asking him questions about where he could be, where he was at, who he's with, timeline, and now they need pictures. Now during this interrogation, Tori's dad, Sean, went downstairs to print cell phone records for Tori's cell phone. After they tell him that he needs to take pictures, 
of his hands and vehicle. It is explained to Tori and Tori's parents that his cell phone records are going to be looked at to see if his story matches his actual cell phone pins. If he was at the movie theater, his cell phone will pin closest to the tower by the movie theater, which is nowhere near the tower that would pin if he was by Cassie's house. After all this explanation, Tori is given a piece of paper where he writes down his statement and where he writes down his official statement of his whereabouts on the night of Cassie's murder. After detectives finish interviewing Tori, they then head to Brian's house who got interviewed by detectives with his mom present. They interviewed him about Cassie's murder and the events surrounding her death. Some articles that I read on Cassie's murder said that during this initial interview with police, Brian started to cry, which isn't a dead giveaway or anything that you are f***ing involved. But I cannot confirm or deny if that is 110% true, but I did read in a couple articles that Brian started to cry initially during this interview with police. So during this interview, Brian basically has the same exact story as Tori. He says they went to Cassie's, they were under the impression it was going to be a party. It ended up just being him, Tori, Matt, and Cassie, and they felt like they were third wheeling. They got bored, so they bounced and they went to go see the movie Pulse. But just like Tori, he could not remember who was in the movie Pulse, any details about the movie Pulse. It was as if they made it up because they did. They did not go to the movies. Suspicious of Brian and Tori's alibis, detectives went to the movie theater where they claim they saw the movie Pulse on the night in question. Now, they interviewed an employee who actually went to school with Brian and Tori and knew of Brian and Tori, and she told detectives that in fact, she was working that evening and Brian and Tori were not at the movie theater at all. So on September 22nd, 2006, when Brian and Tori claimed they left Cassie Cassie's house and went to the movie theater, this movie theater told detectives they were absolutely not there, confirming police detectives' suspicions that the boys were lying. On September 26, 2006, Brian was interviewed again by police, but this time it was at the police station. Brian told police that when they arrived at Cassie's family's home, Matt, him and Tori got Matt, him, Matt, and Tori looked through every window of Cassie's home. That's sketchy. Why are you looking through every window of Cassie's home? And he said Matt. So this is another reason why I believe Matt was involved. Why is Matt looking through every window of his girlfriend's family's home with the two guys that killed his girlfriend? Clearly, Matt again, like I've pointed out through this entire video, is somehow involved. He's clueless to what's going on, right? Right, absolutely. He's so clueless. He has no idea why these two boys want to look through every window. Like what conversation were they even having when they were looking through every window? Window about her murder like that means Matt is involved like hello people I don't give a f about the polygraph test put this mother in jail Brian still maintained that him and Tori went to go see the movie pulse but he still had no idea what the movie was about he couldn't remember shit he said it was boring he fell asleep I don't know what his excuses were but he could not remember shit about the movie because he didn't go. The interview ended and Brian left with his parents. Now at this point his parents gave detectives permission to search Brian's belongings in his room. So while they are searching Brian's room they find a empty nut protective sheath for a knife under Brian's bed. The knife is missing. Brian tells detectives that that protective sheath belongs to one of his friends. He also says he has no idea where the knife is but it must be with the friend who the sheath belonged to. No names were given. I don't know what friend he was referring to. He just blamed it on somebody else other than himself. On September 27, 2006, Brian agreed to another interview. During this interview, he agreed to be interviewed without a lawyer present. Brian said in this interview that he himself unlocked the basement door with the intentions of going back into the house to scare Cassie and Matt with Tori. He also said that this was supposed to be a big joke. He didn't think anyone was actually to be killed and Tori did all the stabbing and he did the stabbing with a serrated knife. I don't know if I'm saying that word correctly but that's basically a knife that has like almost teeth like or sh sharp little pointy edges that look like teeth. The ones that have like a sharp cutting edge. 
Ryan told detectives that he himself was carrying a non-serrated knife, a large curved non-serrated knife, which is a which is a straight edge knife. And usually non-serrated knives are known to cut through meat easily. Ryan then tells detectives that Tori and him went to Black Rock Canyon and buried evidence. He also agreed to bring detectives to Black Rock Canyon to show them where exactly he buried the evidence with Tori. They got to Black Rock Canyon and Brian pointed out an area. The detectives and their team started digging up this area and they did in fact find a bag full of shit. They tried to burn some of it, some of it didn't burn. This bag included evidence such as stick matches, a pair of black boots, a pair of blue rubber gloves, another pair of fingerless gloves, I think they're workout gloves, a melted brown hydrogen peroxide bottle, a multicolored mask, a large dagger type of knife with a sheath, a Sony videotape that was damaged but then repaired and used in trial, and the evidence on this tape is damning to both Corey and Brian. A black serrated folding knife which actually had Cassie's blood on it, a partly burned piece of paper and they could make out some of the words such as deathless on it so they intended on having a high body count and had the names of other classmates they were hoping to kill. It's like kind of crazy because even if you're nice to kids that are considered outcasts, they could still potentially want to kill you. For instance, Brian killed Cassie because Cassie didn't want to be with him and she was with Matt, but Cassie was never mean to him. She was nice to him. He considered Cassie a friend. So even at that, he still wanted to kill her. They found a red and white mask and with DNA testing on the mask, it was Tori's DNA from the inside of that mask. A pair of partially burned puma black gloves. These gloves were actually soaked in Cassie's blood. A blue plastic garbage bag. A partially burned black long sleeve shirt. A Calvin Klein dress shirt. Cassie's blood was actually found on the cuff of the sleeve of this Calvin Klein shirt. They also found a white and gray sock and a small piece of black cord. After detectives brought Brian to Black Rock Canyon and led them to this evidence, he also told detectives that he did in fact stab Cassie four times, but Tori forced him to do it and he didn't want to. He said he stabbed Cassie in the chest and leg area and Tori kept yelling at him saying, you need to stab her, you need to stab her. When he stabbed her in the leg, Tori said that isn't going to work, she has to die. Brian then asked for his parents and the interview ended. While Brian is detained in custody, Tori's parents brought him to the police station to be interviewed for the second time. At this point in time, neither Tori nor his parents knew that Brian led investigators to the evidence at Black Rock Canyon, and they had no idea either that Brian had confessed to stabbing Cassie four times under the order and demand of Tori. Tori's story remained the same, except this time he told police that he was lying about going to the movies, but in fact him and Brian were robbing people's cars, and the reason he wasn't telling the truth the first time about this detail was because he had a friend who had been on probation for doing the same thing, robbing people's cars, and he didn't want to get in trouble for that. But he maintained that him and Brian returned to his house at 11.30 p.m., where they remained for the rest of the evening. But witnesses had previously told detectives that they saw Tori at a local convenience store called Common Sense after 11.30 p.m. So detectives asked Tori, okay, well, if you stayed at your house for the remainder of the evening, why do I have witnesses that can put you at Common Sense after 11.30 p.m.? And then Tori's like, oh yeah, well, we went to Common Sense to grab some matches for Brian's cigarettes, and also Brian wanted a soda, so we got him a soda because he didn't like what we had in the fridge. Eventually, Tori admits to detectives that him and Brian took a joyride to Black Rock Canyon, but he does not tell detectives anything about the evidence or anything about the murder. He just said that they randomly went there when they re-left the house. At this point, detectives are fed up with Tori and his lies, and they let him and his parents know that they have the evidence they buried at Black Rock Canyon, and it was time for him to tell the truth. 
Tori then asked if he could have an attorney, and the interview was immediately stopped. Tori and his father, Sean, were put into another room so they could have a moment of privacy. Detectives rejoin Tori and his father, Sean. Detectives let Tori know that he is, in fact, going to be arrested. The interview ended, and detectives took Tori's shoes, which he claimed he was wearing the night of Cassie's murder. Prior to Tori being arrested, he denied killing Cassie, and still to this day, he denies taking part in her actual killing incapable of something like this and it completely caught me off guard i was just in i don't know i just couldn't believe it it, it did happen i was just too shocked to do anything and i just ran from it and hid from it and i made a lot of mistakes but they were I don't know, I just think, I look at myself now and I'm 21 and I think how stupid I was at 16 and I just think how I feel like I'm paying for somebody else's mistakes at this point. I'm gonna show some of the video footage that I found online and then for the other video footage that was not online, I'm just gonna read some of the transcripts that I found in articles that I read online. Tori says, you're evil, laughs. Brian says, yes I am, so are you dude, evil, evil. Tori says, no, evil is an expression of God. That was another test you failed. Brian responds, evil is not an expression of God. Tori says, yes it is. Brian says, that is bullshit and you know it. Tori says, evil of origin is a follower of f***ing Satan. Brian, there is no Satan. Tori, is Satan real? Then shut up. Brian, then how are we supposed to express ourselves? Tori, good and bad. Brian, we're, we're bad. Tori, we are bad. Brian, that sounds so shitty. Tori, we're evil? That sounds even shittier. Brian, hey, we're not, okay? Then we are six psychopaths who get their pleasure off killing other people. Tori, that sounds good, baby. Brian, we're gonna go down in history. We're gonna be just like Scream except real life terms. Tori, that sounds good, baby. Brian, we're gonna be murderers. Like, let's see, Ted Bundy, like the Hillside Strangler. Tori, no. Brian, the Zodiac Killer. Tori, those people were more amateurs compared to what we are gonna be. We're gonna be more of higher sources of Ed, Brian, gang. Tori, gang. Brian, laughs. Well, let's say we're that sick and that twisted. Tori, oh, and you know what Ed Gang's words were? Brian, what? Tori, he saw a girl walking down the street, right? Brian, yeah. Tori, two questions came to his head. Hmm. I could take her out and have a nice time with her. Brian, and then kill her, skin her alive. Tori says, charm the pants off her, or I wonder what her head would look like on a stick. Laughs. First of all, Tori, that wasn't Ed Gang. That was Ed Kemper, the co-ed killer. Get your f***ing serial killers correct if you want to be one. Ed Kemper and Ed Gang would be highly disrespected right now, okay? They're serial killers and pieces of shit, but you're confusing their work. Ed Gang, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Ed Kemper, head on a stick. Let's get it together, Tori. Okay, you wanna act cool? You wanna act like you know your facts? Then know your facts, please and thank you. Let's continue. Brian laughs. Holy shit, Tori, it's creepy, huh? Brian, kick ass. Brian, murder is power, murder is freedom, goodbye. Tori, um, yeah, um is the correct fucking words for all of this. So this is from September 21st, 2006. Tori and Brian are in a car. Adam is driving and Tori is filming. Tori is driving and Brian is filming. And this is the transcripts that I found. Brian, we're going for a high death count, Tori. Plus, we're not gonna get caught, Brian. If we're going for guns, we're gonna end it. We're just gonna grab the guns and get out of there and kill everybody and leave. Brian, we're gonna make history. We're gonna make history. Tori, for all of you FBI agents watching this, Brian laughing. Tori, uh, you weren't quick enough, laughing. Brian, you weren't quick enough and you weren't smart enough and we're going to Jane Doe's house. We're going to snoop around over there and try to see if she's home alone or not. And if she's home alone, splat, she's dead. Tori, don't put your humor into this, Brian. Brian, uh, I'm not putting any humor into it. Yep, people will die and memories will fade. Tori, memories will fade. I, hmm, I wonder what movie you got that from, Brian. Brian, myself. Tori, laughing. Brian, that was from myself. Tori, no wonder it was so lame. Brian, K, we're on our way and I'm gonna, I'll let you stay tuned, we're almost there. So they're still driving around and this is continued conversation from the 
footage. This is footage that I actually don't have. I don't have the full video clips, but this is also some transcripts. Brian says, my friend's too pussy to go investigate. Turn here. Tori says, too smart. Brian says, why aren't you turning there, dude? Tori says, because it's faster this way. Brian says, now we're going over to Cassie and Matt's house. If they're home alone, we're gonna. Tori says, it's Cassie's house. Matt is there. Brian says, Matt is there. Sorry, we're gonna, we're gonna knock on the door. We'll see who is there. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. See if their parents are home or not. If they're home alone, we will leave our way and then we will come back in about 10 minutes. We'll sneak in through the door because chances are they're probably in Cassie's room. So we'll sneak in the front door. We'll make a noise outside. Tori and Matt will come out to investigate. Brian, we'll kill him and we'll scare the shit out of Cassie, okay? Oh, damn. I didn't read this before I started filming, so maybe Matt wasn't involved, you guys. And I was just being a bitch for no reason. Or maybe they did this on purpose to protect their friend. Or maybe Matt was involved and helped out and had no idea his friends had plans to kill him too. Because I just don't see how Matt, him and his mom and his story just don't add up. And it'll never add up and it'll never sit right for me. But this also is like, but this is somebody writing down the transcripts. I didn't actually hear any of this or witness any of this. So I don't know if these transcripts are 110%, but let's keep going. Tori then says, sounds like fun. Brian says, well, stay tuned. Okay, so this is on the night of the murder. Brian and Tori have left and they're in the car and they start refilming. Brian says, we're here in his car. The time is 9.50, September 22nd, 2006. Um, unfortunately, we have the grueling task of t killing our two friends and they are right in that house just down the street. Damn, so they were really trying to kill Matt too. So what the Holy shit. Tori, we just talked to them. We were there for an hour, but Brian cuts him off. We checked out the whole house. We know there's a lot of doors. There's a lot of places to hide. Um, I unlocked the back doors. It's all unlocked. Now we just go go to wait and um yep we're we're really nervous right now but you know we're ready tori says we're listening to the greatest rock band ever brian says we've waited for this for a long time tori says pink floyd before we commit the ultimate crime of murder brian says we've waited for this for a long time tori says a long time brian says well stay tuned by Thursday, September 28th, 2006, both Tori and Brian were arrested and charged with first degree murder and the conspiracy to commit murder. Before trial, both Tori and Brian moved to sever, which basically means they will be tried separately, not together. So they will have individual trials, not a trial together. Brian's defense team tried to get Brian's last interview suppressed from trial because his last interview is the one where he admits to stabbing Cassie multiple times and to murdering her. They tried to get it suppressed because he's claiming his mommy and daddy were not present during that interview, but he invoked his right to counsel and he agreed to talk without a lawyer present. So that motion was denied, you bitch ass. Motion denied. Motion denied, Brian. Yeah. Motion denied. In trial, a forensic pathologist by the name of Dr. Charles Garrison had examined Cassie's body and had determined that out of the 30 wounds, 12 of them were fatal or had the potential to be fatal. Most of those wounds were caused by a serrated knife. However, there was a stab wound to the chest that hit the heart that was done with a non-serrated blade. And that stab wound to the heart had the potential to be fatal. During Brian's interview, he said that he carried a non-serrated blade while Tori carried the serrated blade. Also in Brian's interview, he admitted to authorities that he had stabbed Cassie in the chest area and her legs. During trial, Tori's friend Joe Lacero said that he bought Brian and Tori $45 worth of knives at the pawn shop. $40 of that was for Brian and his three knives and $5 of that was for Tori and his one knife. He said that three out of the four knives that he bought at the pawn shop were serrated and there was only one non-serrated blade. All four of the knives that Joe bought Tori and Brian from the pawn shop were buried at Black Rock Canyon where the evidence was found. During Joe's testimony in court, he made it a point to say that Brian wanted 
ownership of the serrated knives but during Brian's interviews with detectives he claimed ownership of the non serrated blade so it's a little confusing who was using what knife etc 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 on April 17th 2007 Brian Jaber was found guilty of first-degree murder and also found guilty for conspiracy to commit murder on June 8th 2007 Tori Adam chick was also found guilty of first-degree murder and the conspiracy to commit murder. On August 21st, 2007, both Brian and Tori received a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole. They also received an additional 30 years for conspiracy to commit murder. Both Brian and Tori have filed notices of appeal with the court. Brian wanted to attempt or be able to attempt to get parole after 30 years. His request was denied, as it should be. Tori, on the other hand, and his psychotic mother were trying to get the entire first degree murder charge thrown out. His whole argument was that the jury and the state did not provide enough sufficient evidence for a jury to determine that he in fact committed first degree murder. He argued that the state failed to provide what stab wounds were fatal in the murder of Cassie and if one of his stab wounds was responsible for her death. Tori also argued in his appeal Cassie's blood was found on one shirt, one knife, and one pair of gloves that all belong to Brian. In the videotape, it's Brian that's screaming, I just killed Cassie, I just killed Cassie, I murdered her. Tori never says that on camera, never admits that on camera, and he is arguing that Brian was solely responsible for her death. He was just there. An interesting part of his appeal was that there was four male DNA under Cassie's fingernails on her right hand. On Cassie's left hand fingernails, there was two male DNA found. Brian's DNA was found on both Cassie's right and left fingernails. But for me, this makes me wonder what other three male DNA were under Cassie's fingernails because Tori's DNA was not found under Cassie's fingernails at all. He argued this in his appeal. But if I was Cassie's mom or family members, I would be curious and I would want to know whose other DNA was under my daughter's nails and how did it get there? Was someone else present in the house? Did somebody come back to the house? How did she get four different male DNAs underneath her? Her fingernails and how did they get there who did they belong to I would want to know that as somebody who's just a curious reader of this case um, a true crime junkie I'm curious as to know who's fucking who's DNA is that we know Brian's is under there Tori's was not under her fingernails so there's still three male DNA underneath her fingernails and I don't have a clue as somebody who's reading these articles online who's DNA is under those nails and I want to know and our family should want to know and I'm surprised this hasn't been talked about I'm actually kind of shocked because if there's other DNA under the nails but that does that mean other people were present it just doesn't make sense to me and I just need answers and I can't provide you those answers because I know you guys are wondering too because I don't have Clue. I just found that interesting. I found that an interesting part of the appeal. Also in Tori's appeal, during the investigation, police searched his bedroom and his home, and in that search, they seized Tori's computer. In this seize of the computer, they found child pornography and videos and websites that were in regards to animal cruelty, which was obviously used against him while he was at trial. His appeal argues that the search warrant did not specify electronics or computers and therefore should have not been used during his trial and used against him. Needless to say, Tori's appeal was denied. It was denied. Sorry, Tori, your get out of free jail card is not gonna work for you. It's not gonna work for you. It's not. Cassie's family did not do well after Cassie's murder, as I probably wouldn't either if I saw something so horrific done to someone I loved. Her aunt Allison fell into depression. She lost her job. Her cousin Kelsey, who was the first person to find her, fell into depression and actually attempted suicide, and they could not sell their home. No one would buy it. No one wanted to live there. It was just a very difficult time for the family. Andrew, Cassie's younger brother, did an interview at some point where he said the family has moved on. They're putting it behind them. I found that a little weird. I don't see how any family could ever move on and put something like this behind them, but to each zone, everyone handles grief differently. So all I can say is the book The Guilty Innocent by Tori's mother is cringeworthy. I read as much as I could, but I read enough to know that she's overbearing. She's one of those moms that I hope if I ever have children 
children I am never like controlling aggressive damn near almost abusive yelled a lot screamed a lot and she claims that this whole thing made her look at herself differently as a mother etc 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 but there is a documentary on YouTube about kids that have gone to jail and have been sent to jail without the possibility of parole and Tori and his family and also Brian is in it and Brian seems remorseful he seems sad he cries a lot he just I, he, he's he's become a cutter I don't know if that he's putting on for the cameras if he thinks this documentary is now his spotlight and fame and feels important doing such but he does seem remorseful Tori on the other hand is almost seems like he's laughing and smiling and is very creepy if the video footage that I've put throughout this is from the documentary I will list the documentary in the description box below if you feel like watching it but Tori seems like he's completely in denial smiling laughing and his mom is still answering for him and on his father's face his father seems quite horrified and almost like he's not engaging much in the conversation because he knows his son's a killer and at at some point in their lives that is the product of them that killer right in front of them the guy that he doesn't even recognize his son is a product of him and his wife and when Tori goes to answer questions his mom is answering for him and she's still overbearing even though she wrote this book where she learned how to be a better mom during this documentary she clearly did not and even the husband's like shut you could tell see in his eyes he's like shut the actual up and she never did and I spent $7.99 on the book and I would really like my money back and I'm never gonna get it back but it is what it is I'm praying for Cassie's family her life was taken so abruptly and so quickly and in for two kids that if they didn't kill Cassie they were gonna kill eventually they were not gonna stop and they were never gonna be stopped until there was bloodshed unfortunately and Cassie fell victim to their f***ed up mentality and their up views on life in general and it's an awful 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 case I still am even though I heard the transcripts I'm a little sketchy about Matt still I'm sketchy about his bullshit story he came up with with his mom I don't know how he played a role in this I don't know if they actually did want to kill him or maybe Brian just wanted to kill him because if you noticed Matt invited Tori over he didn't invite Brian remember I mentioned that earlier and then Tori was the one calling Matt on the phone not Brian so maybe it was Brian who wanted to kill Matt but Matt was in cahoots with Tori I don't know but something about it's off you comment below your thoughts on the entire situation let me know what you think but that's it that's today's true crime case Give this video a thumbs up or a thumbs down but as I always say if you're giving it a thumbs down you probably shouldn't be on this channel but if you are gonna be here make sure you hit that subscribe button but also hit the bell because if you don't hit the bell you will not get notifications and if you don't get notifications what is the point there is not most importantly go to the description box and subscribe to me and Gabby's wave ride the wave.com slash the Victor twins slash post for exclusive content such as mukbangs vlogs story times you name it all my social media is also linked below I love you guys to the moon and back be safe be careful who you are friends with who you're dating don't let anyone at your house when you're home alone don't tell anyone you're home alone some things are meant to be private and sometimes you're just meant to be alone and if you are alone be like Macaulay Culkin at home alone get some fake cardboard cutouts act like there's a mother party going on and man I don't know there's sometimes situations are unavoidable and for Cassie Jo Stoddard her death was unavoidable these boys had a plan and they carried it through and they planned on a high body count they wanted to commit this murder and commit more and luckily they were stopped so at least that was a blessing I love you guys good night